to start off, uh, we have our lead air, lead artist, Sarah Scruggs here. Um, God, I just got to redo that. I just got to redo the whole thing. This is it. This is why we're not doing this live because it's too much pressure. And I'm just going to... It's okay. All right, so today we're having a conversation. This is a little bit different than our normal content that we have on our streams. Usually we're just showing tutorials or showing new features, but today we're gonna give an in-depth look at how artists are using Speedtree in some of the biggest video games out there today, which in the case of today is gonna be Assassin's Creed Valhalla from Ubisoft. A quick introduction to who we have on the stream. We've got Sarah Scruggs, who is the lead artist over at Speedtree. She is the one in charge of spearheading most of our new techniques in Speedtree, kind of leading development, as well as just curating our entire library of trees. So she is really our tree wizard, master of all things Speedtree. We also have Adrian Paye Brunella. Uh, hopefully I said that name right. He is a tree artist over at Ubisoft. I don't know what your exact title is, and I should probably know that. Yeah, my my title is environment artist, yeah, and I'm I'm creating the biomes of uh, Assassin's Creed. How did you end up at Ubisoft? My path was uh, really uh, uh, really strange because I started studying at Fine Arts in France uh, for four years. I then started to work in the culture industry. It was really great, but I, I didn't. I didn't feel like I was really um, aligned with uh, what I wanted to do. I moved uh, in Montreal to uh, to pursue my dream. And I started university uh, at Montreal, uh, at NAD. And then uh, during a project, uh, I think at, at the end of the last year, uh, one of my friends, who is now one of my colleagues on Assassin's Creed, uh, Damien Audi, we were working on an environment and nobody wanted to, to make the trees and the vegetation. And I was like, all right, what? why not? <laughs> this is... This is something I love in the, in, in the real life, so, so why not? Uh, nobody wants to do it, I'll do it. Really intimidating and it was, it was really not clear because there aren't, aren't a, a lot of, um, of content about uh, the pipeline, about the, the workflow and that kind of stuff. That friend just, uh, I think it was the middle of the night because we were working uh, like 24 hours a day. And, and just, uh, he just sat next to me and he was like, do you know Speed Tree? I was like, no, but speed and tree together. Uh, this sounds like a, <laughs> this sounds like my redemption because I really need it now. I think I spent the whole summer uh, in speed tree, just trying to learn things, to play with the recipe, with the notes. So, so yeah, this is uh, this is how I get connected to speed tree, and then uh, it, it just clicked. Uh, I knew that this is uh, what I wanted to do uh, for for my pro professional path and for my specialization. I started working uh, in freelance, and then uh, I started working uh, at Ubisoft, yeah, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, uh, which is my first uh, AAA uh, production from the start till the end. That's awesome. So what version of Speedtree did you start in? So I think it's 5, and then the Speedtree I worked the most in is uh, Speedtree 6.3. This is like uh, my, my baby, my, <laughs> my favorite, I, I really love that build. In fact, uh, for the whole production, we worked uh, with Speedtree 6 because um, it, it, it fit for all our needs uh, on the production. So we didn't want to just update the software just for the sake of updating the software because uh, we had all of our workflow in it. Once you have a tool in your pipeline, especially at larger organizations, you don't necessarily have the freedom to just jump over to another tool. These small beneficial changes may require a lot of engineering time in other departments to make sure that everything works together. So. I know over at Ubisoft, like we've got teams that are still working on six, some are working on seven, some are working on eight, some are already on nine. It's kind of just the whole gamut. Yeah, because as you said, we have different needs for our outputs. And, and for Assassin's Creed, for example, we have a very uh, franchise-specific constraint. The parkour uh, in Assassin's Creed is driven by the geometry. So when you see a tree, it needs to look like it's climbable or not. The, the gray area is really a big danger for us. So this is why it, it was risky to, to lose like the expertise we had with the, the hand editing and the spline tool uh, in Speed 36. And it is a really interesting problem that you guys have to tackle there. In other worlds, you just have to have the trees that are set dressing. So at kind of, they're essentially level art, but trees and this world had to be very interactable. As you said, it was a, a, a real big challenge because it's the first uh, title in the franchise that has so omnipresent and lush vegetation everywhere. 
So it was a, a lot of um, technical development, art development, and it was a, a big game changer for us uh, in the production. In fact, uh, England is uh, is less exotic from the previous title, and it, it its exotism is more in the subtle details and uh, and variations and moods and weather to bring all these subtleties uh, in the game and and create something like uh, grandiose. In fact, because we had a or artistic pillars from uh, Rafael Lacoste, our art director. They were uh, grandiose, varied, and otherworldly. So, so it was our three focus for uh, for the vegetation as well as the open world. It was really a, a big ingredient to the to the journey uh, we wanted to make for the world because vegetation is everywhere. Like most of the time, at least half of the screen of the player's camera, and uh, it's really like a, a a big deal. So, so we really wanted to, to work a lot to 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 get that sense of uh, variety, but as well uh, quality from far and for, for close-up uh, details as well. And the vegetation was really a, a new and big way to convey uh, mood for uh, for the game. We wanted to create a, a harsh and unforgiving Norway. And when you, you escape Norway uh, to to arrive in England, it's like very lush. Uh, you have the swamps, you have the, the hills uh, with the fields and the, the big oaks and that kind of stuff. The, the, Typical, in fact, uh, Robin Hill's uh, English landscape. And it was really, we needed that clash to be really strong between the, the two uh, territories. We had to make sure that the silhouettes were interesting enough to, to allow like standalone composition, but as well uh, to, to avoid repetition in the scattering. It was a big challenge, but uh, I, I'm really proud of, uh, of what we did. And, and I think, uh, I think uh, what I'm most proud of is, uh, is uh, yeah, the, the bonding of the team, because it was really great to, to do that game. Uh, all together and the, the biome team together and the world team together it was really a, a pure joy but the the seasons and all the variations we made and the blending between biomes is really something uh and it took all the production to get it right but this is that kind of subtlety that i really love because from a player perspective even if you don't look at the vegetation or look at the natural environment if something is wrong you will notice it and even without uh, knowing exactly what it is, you will know that something is off. And this is uh, some kind of thing that we really worked on to, to get that sense of uh, credibility because uh, we are as well uh, an historical franchise, so, so we need to, to get that uh, accuracy, but also to, to get that pictorial and painting uh, approach that, uh, that our art director, uh, Raphael, uh, wanted for the game. So it was, a, it was a, everything was about balance between uh, realism and civilization. The trees present a very interesting conceptual problem to me in that you're not trying to recreate reality, right? Because reality doesn't necessarily communicate anything. If I look outside and look at these trees, everything that I see on those trees, I'm imparting on those trees. Your goal as an environment artist is to have the trees impart something to the viewer rather than just allowing them to carry their own impressions of trees. With what you guys are trying to do with a large open world, that problem is compounded even more because you have to have them be very functional and operate on multiple levels at a time, right? Like you have to have these hero trees that convey a mood, the large open world trees that like from a distance it conveys that mood. When you guys are looking at the actual vegetation from England and doing that research, what's your guys' process for translating that into a tree that can work on so many different levels? Like, what, what's your what's your approach to that kind of conceptual problem? I, I just uh, start over with the first part of your sentence that I found really interesting, reality and, and uh, recreate the reality. We see enough tech demos, mostly uh, with the uh, lumen and, and the, that kind of stuff. It's really great because it, it's really uh, helped to step up the, the whole industry and the whole uh, graphical uh, advancement. But Recreating reality uh, and creating just the tech demos to show like um, beautiful mega scans or, or photogrammetry assets and that kind of stuff, it's really nice because for the big picture of, this, of the industry, it really step up the game. But when we look at portfolios, when we look at games, for every ingredient, uh, the vegetation uh, as well, we really want to, to feel like the salt in it, like the, the what is the artistic purpose behind it. That, comes back a bit uh, uh, what we spoke all year about uh, thinking something is off. You can feel, in fact, when you know that something is missing, like a cell or, or something, and this is really what uh, what we wanted to bring uh, in the vegetation because it was important. And for the, the top process, it was a, a lot and a lot and a lot of research. In fact, uh, it was uh, early uh, 2018. Uh, we started the, the conception of uh, Valhalla and uh, we did like a, a ton of research about the biomes, so the rocks, uh, 
uh, the geology formations of England and Norway, the, the landscape, because we wanted the big lush forest, but as well a barren landscape uh, with a very uh, positive and negative spaces. So it was a lot of uh, a lot of research, and in fact, I think we found for the vegetation between sixty and eighty species, and we 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 had to sort it through because uh, we we didn't have the bandwidth to do uh, all that stuff, mankind and tech wise. We started through um, uh, with the, the historical uh, accuracy in mind uh, and on focus as well to select the species. For example, for the bluebells, like the typical uh, bluebells uh, forest with the beach uh, in England. We looked at all the, the blue flowers we found and, and picked only the one that had like a, the better shape, the better density and the better color uh, that we wanted. For, the same for the heather, for example. Heather fields uh, were really like a, a must have even without uh, starting the research. So, so we knew that we wanted like a, that kind of a very vibrant uh, pink and red uh, a coast uh, in England. We started our research uh, with more um, botanical drawings and then we started doing research more on a painting approach like uh, is there a painting of England? What are the colors? What are the shapes? Uh, what uh, flower for example can be used uh, for both biomes? We had to keep in mind uh, the artistic direction, the historical accuracy and the, the constraint of the franchise and the, uh, the budget in fact because uh, we, we knew that uh, we would ship it on uh, PS4, Xbox, uh, Xbox One, but also next gen. So it was a, it was really a big challenge because the, the range of uh, platforms was really really large, and uh, the, the tech constraint was was really a, a challenge as well. So, so one more question about uh, just like that environment uh, aspect. There's a lot of interesting research being done and initiatives being done in the UK about rewilding and understanding a historical perspective of kind of sylvia culture and the forests um, and what they used to look like when you guys were doing research did you did you dive into that that idea of these forests look different now than they would have back in the viking times like our you know human impact on the environment has adjusted how these trees grow like did you guys interact with that at all when kind of creating these biomes yeah totally because uh, we had to once again find the balance between the stylization that we wanted like the the, the very omnipresent and, and strong vegetation everywhere and also to, to to convey that England was really a land of a lot of layers of history because first uh, there were Romans everywhere, so there are a lot of uh, abandoned Roman ruins. They were like uh, really ghost cities with only uh, uh, Roman ruins, and the 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 people who lived here uh, at the at the era uh, were afraid, in fact, of those ruins. So uh, it was really a, a nice uh, moody atmosphere for for a kind of swampy. Uh, biomes and uh, after there were Saxons and then the, the Viking invasion so, so there were a lot of influences a lot of um, agriculture and, and it was really uh, really interesting to, to think about what England was and not what England is. Going on and diving into everything that makes up the environment the, the edit and the watering down of the precise elements that actually make up the scene are just as important as doing that gather stage where you're like, oh, this is so rich, I can do this and this and this and this. I know ahead of time, because we've talked, that you kind of have a mantra that yeah. every shape matters, I guess. Yeah, really, like, this is really like, um, a, I had it uh, written on top of my uh, desk and it's really like a, a mantra that I keep uh, repeating. <laughs> I think it was really interesting when you were talking about like the bluebells and kind of identifying that key, like this is something that's culturally specific, but it also kind of gives you a paintbrush of color when you're using, it's a, it's a painting term, I guess, but blocking in a scene mm -hmm. when you have that one plant that really shines out and that's what you're using to kind of hone in the space and I ran I just wondered if you could talk yeah. a little bit about that also do you when you work with your team are you the one making those decisions of like editing and watering it down and being <laughs> like no we're doing this this is a, a big process yeah yeah and in fact the, the, the whole uh, turning down uh, process is really heartbreaking because we have to let go species that we really wanted to make but yeah this is this is just a uh, for another game maybe <laughs> yeah <laughs> But uh, yeah, it, it's really an interesting, uh, a really interesting uh, phase because, as you said, the, the first uh, half of the phase is only like uh, having a ton of pure rough documents and dragging uh, like images everywhere from shapes, from drawings, from painting, and it's just like a a big mess <laughs> at the end because there are a lot of references from everywhere. We knew like the structure of the team, Joel Pelton 
and I would be like the, the vegetation artist for the whole game. Besides that, there were a lot of other members for the Bion teams, like uh, for the texture, we had Alexandre Robert, Alfredo Christian Ziano, and Pierre Alexandre Côté. And for the, the whole uh, scattering pipelines, we had the technical artists like um, uh, Miakim Lavalle, Pierre Alexandre Pascal. And it was really like nice teamwork, in fact, to bring uh, those big open spaces with vegetation because we, we had to, to think about giving enough ingredients to scatter the world uh, on a large scale but as well to allow the hand editing for the composition purposes and, and that kind of stuff. So yeah, we had to think about the shapes on a generic way for filling open spaces and as well as a, a big strong silhouettes for the, the more um, unique hand placement and that kind of stuff. We, we have to think the vegetation as assets we give to the world team to create that kind of uh, spaces. We have to make sure that we have an, an interesting range of shapes, of colors, of, um, of density because uh, it's also interesting uh, tech-wise because we have to make sure that we have uh, enough positive and negative spaces in the foliage area to avoid overdraw but as well to allow uh, enough light uh, to get uh, in the heart of the forest because it was really uh, really dark uh, otherwise and it's really interesting to, to keep that tech development as well to have a big opaque uh, forest uh, from a far distance but uh, as well, uh, credibility and not too much overdraw uh, on the close-up uh, detail. So yeah, and uh, all the, the, the sorting process uh, was done by uh, Joel and I, uh, and, and the, the macro level uh, was uh, directed by, by uh, Rafael Lacoste, and uh, Vladimir Escandari, which our art director associate, is also, uh, was also, sorry, uh, in charge of uh, the, the map of uh, the biomes and the, the big picture of... Uh, of all that, yeah. And in fact, uh, we, <laughs> him and I are presenting that uh, on a whole breakdown uh, at the GDC uh, next uh, in July. I'm looking forward to that. That's going to be a really exciting talk. I feel like it's going to be one of those talks that here at Speedtree, whenever we have conversations with customers, there's always GDC talks that are referenced, right? Horizon Zero Dawn was a talk that like we still hear brought up like, oh, like in that talk. And I feel like this is going to be one of those talks like, oh, like in that Assassin's Creed Valhalla talk when they did this. <laughs> yeah, the talk of uh, Horizon uh, by uh, Gilbert Sanders is really like, it was a game changer for us. And I, I have it like a, one of my main bookmarks on my browser it's always like a go-to when i'm working in i think I, I listen to it like every month or or so it's really a really really interesting yeah i can't wait to dive into that so in talking about like every shape matters can you talk a little bit more about kind of both on the broad scale of the shape of trees for a horizon the shape of trails trees for individuals what what, what approach do you guys do to kind of make those individual trees like well, yeah yeah uh first uh then this is the, the pipeline we, we developed with Joel Pelton once again. And this is like, we need to focus on the recipe first to create like a, not to, to dive too deep in the tree, more like uh, playing with the nodes and with the, the random settings to, to have a enough, in fact, range to create a different uh, first iteration of our trees. So like a, a different interesting shapes and that kind of stuff. And then when we, we were happy with the, with the shape, we, we just starting uh, hand editing it with uh, adding nodes uh, only uh, uh, make sure that every branch, every uh, cluster of foliage is uh, is uh, worked on and uh, hand edited. So yeah, this is really like, um, for example, yeah, in, the, in the video, you can see that the shape is important for the composition uh, in the silhouette mode, but as well for the, the parkour opportunities and, uh, and that kind of stuff. So yeah, we, we always start with the recipe. We will create a bank of trees by species. We created a recipe for the oaks, for the beach, for the birch. We have to, to have a nice first silhouette every time we press randomize all. This is like our go-to because after that, we can, we can start working on the size, on the different uh, uh, positive and negative space. So we really have to commit to the, to the, the recipe first. And when we are happy with the, the recipe, we start diving deep into the hand editing, the spline, yeah, all the, the, the thing that give us all to, to our assets. This is really what I love about Speedtree is we don't, we do not use it as a, as a complete pipeline. We use it really like a, a different pencil uh, for our painting. This is like for us, the perfect tool to have that uh, sweet balance between stylization and realism. We tried a lot uh, the photogrammetry and that kind of pipeline at the start of Valhalla, but we found it too realist for our, our game because we wanted uh, that kind of painting approach for the art direction. And we didn't uh, go as well with the ZBrush and polypaint technique because we found it too stylized. 
So it was a mixed balance from software before speed tree to create the texture, to create the clusters and that kind of stuff. And then we, we use a hand editing, uh, adding nodes and moving the nodes. And uh, this is what is allowing us to create uh, those shapes and to think about uh, all that composition purpose, uh, even in the vegetation. It almost seems like a key feature for a lot of those trees were to stick mushrooms and ivy on like everything. <laughs> I feel like everything was kind of blended between the two. <laughs> I think uh, I think I had that. Uh... Yeah, I kind of wondered about what recipe you guys were passing around. You know, like do you guys kind of communicate in noise patterns between when you're working? You just tell everybody to you know match the squiggliness um, or <laughs> what? <laughs> in fact, <laughs> What's in fact, the, the, we start working with a generic filler texture for the bark. For this big oak, for example, my first node was only like the, the big part of the trunk. I was only working for this part, uh, adding notes and that kind of stuff with the external mesh placement on it. Then I added the roots with the only forces and the, I exported uh, the main trunk and then added it as a force on it to grow like uh, roots and details on it. And then when I was uh, satisfied with the shape of the main trunk, I, I added only in a hand drawing uh, big branches. When we work uh, with Joel uh, on trees, we always start by hiding everything we're not working on to not like uh, try to work on everything at the same time. We, we hide, for example, all the foliage and we don't care about the foliage until all the skeleton of the tree is really like top notch and we're really uh, satisfied with it. so so this is this is really like a a layer kind of step we work on the on the on the trunk then we have details because we had the separate mesh meshes sorry we we had on top of it then we work on the main branches then on all the the ramification on the branches and where we're happy with that we hide the foliage and most of the time it's a big mess with the foliage everywhere and then we start uh, working on uh, all the clusters and the position of it uh, we use the the overdraw viewer in speed tree to make sure that we don't have too much overdraw uh, from every angle and uh, it's always a, a lot of back and forth between uh, speed tree and the engine sometimes you work the whole day in speed tree working on the tree and then you export it uh, in the engine and it's really too small, so it's like, all right, I need to, to work again and to, to add up the scale, but all my settings are uh, linked to that scale. So yeah, it's always a lot of back and forth to figure the, the right recipe, the right size and the, the right density. I see a lot uh, of that in uh, the students' work. It was the same for me when I, I still was a student. You don't need to be afraid to show your work at every time of the production, even if it's not ready. Because it's easy to, to keep it like secret until it's very perfect and really like a, the, the end product that you want to show. But it, it's better for you, for your work, to just detach from it and, and show it like the most and always be ready to show it because feedback is, is essential to that part. For example, we had weekly reviews uh, with our art director, uh, associate art director as well to to figure uh, the, the whole picture because it, it's nice to dive into a tree but we, we made a open world so we had to make sure that every trees fit together and, and convey the mood at a large scale and it's easy to get lost in the details. So yeah, we had uh, weekly reviews. We also had Gilles Belleuil and Dong Lu Yu, our concept artists, working uh, on the silhouettes. In fact, we, we gave them a lineup of our trees and they just uh, did the paint overs and that kind of stuff. And it, it was really, really helpful. This is really a thing that is important and uh, a lot of people uh, are afraid to show their work. We always know what we want it to look like, but we have, yeah, it, it needs to look really shitty for a long time before it's cool. This battle against our ego and that kind of stuff. But yeah, this is, uh, this is really important and we embraced it uh, early in the production. In fact, to, to always be ready to show uh, what we're working on and to receive, in fact, a lot of feedback on the shapes uh, from the art team, but as well from the design team, because uh, it's easy to get like uh, false calls in the trees. Or, yeah, we do not work in film and we do not make like a, a big cinematographic shots. We make a game and we really had to make sure that our trees are bulletproof uh, gameplay wise for the, the parkour, for the navigation in forest or uh, when you're uh, on a horse and that kind of stuff. So it's, it's really important to, to receive feedback, uh, the, the most feedback possible, in fact. I think that's actually such an important thing for artists who are starting to work in a team to hear is that it's not the final product that needs the feedback. It's the process. Yeah, like, yeah. 
working on a team is very much like playing music together. Uh, everyone needs to be on yeah, the same yeah. rhythm. Everyone needs to be communicating on that same wavelength. Accepting critique on your, like conceptualizing the tree is as important as the final product because that's what's really gonna bring the team together and kind of make it cohesive, um, you know, yeah. in product. This is the same method as the elevator pitch. We need it even in the art production of, uh, of our asset because it's easy when we, we spend too much time, in fact, in the details to get to that uh, tech demo photo real look that we really want to avoid because we want storytelling for our assets. For the big picture, yes, as well, but for each asset, we need storytelling in them. In the shapes, in the colors, in the volume, everything is important and every shape matters. Yes. <laughs> The number one thing people get held up on when they're building a tree is they don't know when to stop. And like when you're yeah, caught yeah. up in the detail and you're just, you just want to make everything look perfect, but you have to step There is, there is no in. end. There is never an end. <laughs> and then there's, you know, the artist's personality that just don't look. It's not. <laughs> yeah. I really do think that was a neat trip that you guys are presenting these, but you're actually putting a silhouette out of each um, tree. And that really just is such a fast way to identify what that look is like in, in a team of people. Um, and the fact that Speedtree can spit those out is, you know, a little shameless yeah. plug there. But... It was, in fact, it was, it was our best tool. And when, for example, when we made a big, large, generic uh, beach trees, we needed to convey that mood of, uh, we can just put the tree uh, in the middle of a field with nothing else uh, around. And this need needs to, to feel like England like the, the typical uh, landscape. So that's why every uh, every asset is important because you never know how the world team, uh, level artist and level designer will use it. And most of the time they use it in a different way than we thought. And it's really better because they, they had a, a new layer of creativity on top of it. This is why the content we provide them uh, needs really to be bulletproof from all perspective, gameplay and art as well. I spoke a bit about earlier, but this is really what I love about uh, your work as well, Sarah because you bring that kind of artistic vibe in your trees, you exaggerate shapes and silhouettes and roots. Your uh, Japanese maple, for example, it's really uh, mind blowing. I really love that kind, when, when I see that kind of um, stylization, but credibility, but, but really solid uh, in the assets. It's so weird too, because sometimes you need trees to be absolutely boring in order to fit in the space yeah. you can't have the twisty turny trees or the star trees <laughs> everywhere you have to make this sort of like generic less branchy tree that will fit in a forest setting because they don't look good together because there's just too much going on and stuff like that um in there yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a balance because you you can't have any tree to be like a big standalone uh, las vegas showcase if everything is uh, outstanding, in fact, for the big picture, nothing will be outstanding because when you, you make too much of something, you, you, in fact, you destroy the feeling. For example, the, the landmark tree, uh, we, we call it landmark, the big oak. We, need, we needed to make sure that uh, it, it wasn't everywhere because otherwise it would have uh, lost the, the purpose of this tree, of that kind of a, a big uh, eye indicator uh, for uh, art composition, but as well for gameplay opportunities. Uh, when you see that kind of big silhouettes uh, from a far distance uh, in the middle of a field, from a player perspective, you, you're like attracted to it. And, and most of the time there is like something uh, to loot, something to an activity or that kind of stuff. So, so this variety needs also, as you said, Sarah, to, to make sure that we have enough, like more generic and boring trees uh, to complement the outstanding ones. We don't want to outshine any of your like star trees. This is just a point of curiosity for me. Did you do anything particular with lighting for the upper canopy? Like, did you guys have a specific look on each tree that you were setting in the clusters to kind of control yeah, yeah, in fact, that? Our uh, lead lighting artist, uh, Virginie Saint-Mars, worked a lot with uh, the time of day. In fact, the, the, all the, the ambience manager and the light uh, to ensure that uh, we we played a lot with the GI inside the forest to ensure that uh, yeah light is passing through canopy but most of the time it's not enough so so we have to make sure to play uh, with the GI to, to make sure that uh, yeah we, we have the feel the color uh, that kind of stuff but also to have enough lighting and 
all the light that is not passing through uh, the canopy. As well, we, we have Philippe Angrignon, which is uh, our technical art director, who worked uh, a lot on the translucency shader. We tried the same method as characters with a subsurface scattering. It was really great on a standalone tree, but in forest, it was not that great because the canopy was too opaque or uh, the translucency was, was not that great. So we needed to exaggerate a lot of translucency and we, we just went with a, a, a basic uh, translucency shader. But yeah, all, all that kind of uh, magic behind it, like the wind and the player deformation and uh, the, the very nice translucency roughness and all uh, is made uh, by uh, our technical artists and uh, technical uh, directors. <laughs> That's again, like the difference between reality and like what you're trying to communicate. What you're trying to communicate is always going to be slightly different. And like we find that we have to adjust the normals a lot on the canopy of the tree to really match where that tree is fitting in is it going to be like a something that has to have that lighting right at the distance is that going to be more important so being able to adjust all those normals inside a speed tree is one thing that we're um that we've yeah. worked a lot on to try to make easier in later versions and also is like a big requested thing to to get that that lighting fix but yeah global illumination inside of a forest is always such a tricky thing like it's yeah for example this is more like a, a standalone setting, but the, the red birch uh, typical forests were really a, a big challenge because if we cranked up the, the GI to 11, everything was shiny red because the snow was really like a, a big uh, receptor for the light. So it was really a, a difficult balance for a lot of forests. Uh, the mossy forest uh, with a lot of uh, crooked trees and vegetation hanging, uh, overgrown vegetation on the trees, was also a big challenge because this is the, the, the area in the game where there are the most vegetation from all the, the territories of the game. So technically speaking, it was really a challenge to, to bring that amount of vegetation at the same place and to have on top of it like a fog and, and lighting effect and GI. So it's really like a, a lot of back and forth between a technical and art direction. Earlier you showed a video where the character is jumping up into the tree and it's the split of a tree and has both hands against the tree. I'm sure there's some kind of like, you know, IK solvers that are going in there to, to make it easier. But when you guys are, are making trees, do you have a specific like, the character has to be able to jump in here and the tree has to be exactly this far apart. How do you guys approach that when we are working inside a speed tree? It's really not common in the industry to have. In, in fact, we have also the constraint that our assets in the, the engine cannot be rotated on the vertical axis and cannot be scaled. So it's, it's, really, it's really like a, a big challenge. In fact, we call them the metrics. The metrics uh, are very strict because the character I key where on the video uh, we see uh, where she, she can climb and that kind of stuff. But we also have the, all the, the AI detection system. So for example, when you're on a branch, you need to be high enough to not be detected for a patrol of guards, for example. And when all these constraints uh, come together, it's really challenging, but we have a really wonderful uh, technical team, uh, programmers, and uh, our engine is really made for, uh, for Assassin's Creed. So everything is made to, to respect uh, these constraints. So we have uh, our custom uh, handmade system to to like target uh, the different spaces uh, where we can climb. We have a, a very nice eye key uh, adapting to that kind of a V shape uh, trunks. We, we have a, a full support uh, behind it. Yeah. It's really, you, you have to think about the big picture on an art uh, point of view, but you also have to think about the big picture on a gameplay and uh, level design and game design uh, point of view. For example, uh, we'll talk about uh, on our GDC talk, but uh, Mid-production, all the berries and mushroom uh, started to, to, to be uh, collectibles for the health and the stamina of the players. Uh, that meant that we couldn't have any uh, mushroom or berries or kind of berries uh, uh, with colors that were not collectibles and interactable. We can't just put berries everywhere. This is really like a new challenge and we, we have to start over the thinking about allowing a, a nice economy design to have a flow between a different pack of bushes to create the, to allow, in fact, the level designers to, to keep, in fact, that control on it, but as well to, to follow our art direction and our previous benchmarks, because we're in mid-production, we cannot start over the whole thing. And I think every game and every uh, studio uh, has uh, their own constraint, but yeah, the one in Assassin's Creed are really, uh, really interesting. <laughs>
You have all the challenges of creating trees for a world that are constrained by the economy of how the game actually works, where the player needs to be able to go, and all the visual cues. On top of all that, you have to optimize it, right, for a large yeah. open world. How do you guys approach that optimization process? Yeah, I'll talk about how we start uh, the, the creation of the trees, because uh, we use speed tree as well for uh, our iRes uh, mesh, for example. We always start with a very high definition and uh, high resolution of all vegetation that we make sets. And then we just like uh, turn down the, the resolution and uh, we bake uh, in max uh, all the, the branches we made to, to make sure that we have a texture and not like a, a 1 million uh, polygon meshes uh, on the trees. And after that, we create a first versions of our trees uh, with, I think, uh, more budget than uh, we are allowed, but it's more in um, incremental. I don't know if it's uh, if it's the right word, but we have like that that big resolution mesh, and then with the the, the quantity of the trees in the game, we can adapt uh, to to reduce uh, some trees to to maybe keep that kind of details in other trees. So it's more like um, we always have the the high resolution layer. Because when you make something too low res, it's really harder to, to step up the, the resolution. But when you have something really high res, it's really easy to decimate, even if it's not that, but that kind of a decimation impact uh, on the resolution. And for the LODs, yeah, it's really a big challenge because uh, when you make a tree, you always uh, think about the, the LOD uh, zero, the one you see uh, every time uh, from a close-up distance. But when you make an open world, the most LOD uh, you see in the world are the LODs uh, three, four, really like the far ones uh, with a really low budget. We use an um, automa automated system, sorry, in our engine. Uh, we used also uh, Houdini in uh, 3ds Max to, to have that kind of control on specific trees. And on top of that, when uh, we, we were satisfied with uh, and the technical and um, the artistic uh, direction, we, we hand edited some LODs to make sure that uh, on the distance, that kind of branch really step up or that kind of uh, silhouettes really uh, is denser, in fact, in the subsequent LODs to have that kind of uh, opaque feeling from a distance. So it's it's hand editing as well on the on the LODs. And in fact, it's really a, an important point because when we look at portfolios, if students already knows that kind of uh, other relation between like the collision and the LODs and everything, that that is really important on an asset because we have all the tools we need to make like the beautiful assets in the world, but we make games, so we need to make sure that the collision is something as well polished as the main tree, the LODs as well. So it's really something important, and, and we really appreciate when we, when we see, in fact, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, even if it's not perfect, but just that kind of mindset and uh, thought process is really like something uh, really important because it, it proves that you you know the industry you will work on. This is really like you have to, to, to know that kind of stuff when you start working because you don't work in film. So once again, you have to make sure that every assets the players will interact with is bulletproof from every perspective, art, technical, gameplay. Yeah. So, so LODs and collisions of the trees is really, uh, are really uh, important. Yeah. Just for like a... Sorry, I think this is completely not the question you were, you were asking. We're going all over the place, but doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> I was just curious, like, uh, what your advice would be for someone optimizing for the first time? What are your lowest LODs like? How far do you drop those trees down, maybe for like a mid-background tree? It's really a try and error and retry and that kind of uh, that kind of work. But it was the, the Assassin's Creed with the most budget for the vegetation uh, that ever were. So, so yeah we had the chance to have a big budget for all the vegetation. Big oak, for example, is like uh, 40,000 uh, triangles that, with the ivy uh, on it and that kind of stuff. When we were uh, reducting our trees, the LOD one was two thirds of the budget of the LOD zero. Starting from the LOD two, it was 50% uh, every time. So 50% for the LOD two, 50% for the LOD three, and then we had the only planes uh, render for the, the LOD4. We call them uh, fakes. It's like the imposter. It's uh, one third for the first to avoid, in fact, the, the popping between uh, the transition between uh, LOD0 and 1. Because most of the time, in fact, it, it's during that transition that you really feel the popping between uh, 
high resolution in uh, LD1 because uh, you curl all the details, the notes, uh, the, that kind of stuff. So we really make sh made sure that we have enough budget to avoid that popping between uh, between LODs. And starting uh, from LOD2, we really uh, cut in the foliage and in the trunks so, like there is no tomorrow. <laughs> Are you guys doing a lot of the photogrammetry? Do you see that being a part of the future? We, we think about photogrammetry as a complementary medium, not a, a complete pipeline. Uh, everything uh, needs to be uh, in photogrammetry because we're not uh, FPS, like a uh, photoreal uh, FPS. We're more like uh, Raphael's art direction is more on the, 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 the big picture, the painting approach, the romanticism. We really want to use the photogrammetry as a tool and not as a, as a complete pipeline. So we, we use photogrammetry for uh, the barks, for uh, some roots, uh, the nuts, that kind of stuff, but only to add details on, uh, on the, the main assets uh, we make in this bit tree. And uh, what I really love about the, the, the testing uh, currently uh, I do in uh, Speed Tree 9 is uh, all the, the mesh deformation uh, within Speed Tree. The really easily, uh, easy, sorry, uh, capability to add like uh, external meshes like photogrammetry and that kind of stuff so so definitely we 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 are looking for photogrammetry um, more present in our games but we really think uh, that photogrammetry is a tool and not a complete like a, a pipeline from uh, a to z yeah it's just it's, it's another paintbrush for you guys it's another way to get the look it's not a way to go out and capture yeah. everything and do it Exactly. What we really love, once again, it's all the storytelling between something. Like, even if it's not uh, visually uh, as great as some tech demos uh, made with lum lumen and uh, everything looks like real life, but even if it's not that pretty, but there is really a soul behind it, there is really, like, artistic thinking, uh, artistic thought process, this is really something that is really important and interesting for us in our work, but as well as when we look at portfolios or projects, for example. When we approach making speed tree, that is really our intent there, is recreating reality is not necessarily the point. I have this conversation a lot. Occasionally we'll get people who call in, they want to know like how scientifically accurate is speed tree. Um, sometimes it's like universities and they're working on projects and it's like, it's, it's not actually scientifically accurate at all because it is an art tool. And yeah. the idea is to enable artists to get to that vision of what they're trying to communicate quickly rather than trying to kind of fight science the whole way. There's there's a lot of interesting stuff that can be done with like perfectly scientifically accurate trees, but at the end of the day, we're all artists, we're all trying to communicate something, whether it's through a movie or a game or just, you know, just a yeah. screenshot. And that is that is really what we're trying to push to. I love the scientific yeah. accuracy side of things. Yeah, but... me as well. In fact, I have nothing against the photorealism and that kind of stuff. It's really really interesting to watch, interesting to learn from it. And it's really what is stepping up the game for the graphics quality in the industry and that kind of stuff. But I really love the art enabling, for, for example, in Speed Tree for all the, the hand editing and that kind of stuff uh, that allows us as well to, to respect the constraints of our brand, but also to to make sure that we have in, interesting silhouettes, interesting uh, composition uh, with the uh, positive and negative spaces. So, so yeah, this is, I love a scientific approach and realism approach, but for a game purpose, purpose, I think this is more accurate to use Petri as an art tool and not that, as a recreation uh, tool. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but when we, when we started doing research and uh, we, we learned about a uh, header, we, we learned that there is a header society in England, which have like the, the, all the RGB colors of the, the header in England. So, so we use that kind of scientific data to make our header with the, the exact RGB colors of uh, the header society. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> what would your advice be for someone who is coming up, starting to experiment with tools? Like, you know, we obviously want them to learn as much speed tree as possible, but like, what, what would you recommend for young artists to kind of start to learn and, and how to approach it? Like, what would your advice be? Yeah. How do we art? I think, <laughs> <laughs> how do we do art? Huh? I think uh, it, it's a never ending battle to, to start something we don't know and, and keep doing it because it's, it's like when we start drawing or, or making 3D and everything look, looks like scrap and we look at ArtStation all the day and everything is perfect and, 
and it's really uh, really heartbreaking and really hard for our egos but keep doing it and um, fake it till you make it this is like a, a big uh, cliche uh, a sentence but it, it's real in fact it's really new for me to, to draw a lot but i'm really uh, diving into drawing and uh, i want that kind of uh, medium to to make me a better artist while doing 3d or that kind of stuff so so it's really even now really hard to to do that and then just after uh, see the the work of uh, our concept artist in the team and and crying uh, under the shower because uh, everything i do looks like crap but yeah this is this is the main advice i think do not be afraid to show early your work to get feedback and try until until everything is natural and you can just confront uh, new challenges another advice would be like to never stop learning because it, it's easy when uh, when you're installed and you have your your pipeline and everything is like rolling and there is no uh, no danger uh, on the horizon it's easy to just like relax and and be in our comfortable uh, pipeline our comfort zone it's it's really important to keep like uh, to keep learning to keep like for example i i I really love uh, testing uh, plugins or, or new softwares or indie uh, weird GitHub's uh, pages with a kind of a plugin. But it, it's really nice because when you, you you create something that doesn't work with a tool or because it just doesn't look right or that kind of stuff, you learn from it because you you know the path which led you there. You know, in fact, the mistakes you made and how to not make that mistake again. Or to have like a Bob Ross... Uh, he used to say a uh, happy accident. I may have missed a completely speed tree if my friend didn't like sat next to me and, and, and do you know speed tree? So, so yeah, you have to be curious. You have to be like, a, I don't know if it's correct in English, but in French, uh, we use like a thirsty. You have to be thirsty for uh, new experiences, for new challenges. You never have to sit back and just uh, relax in your comfortable uh, pipeline. It's, uh, it's too easy to, to in French, uh, we say encroute, to just stay there and uh, not moving forward, in fact, uh, to, to new challenges because the, the industry is really evolving fast and every every games that is shipping is really a big step up for the industry. So it's always like a, a new game is pushing the industry higher and that kind of stuff. So we need to stay on top of our game and we need uh, as artists to just be always on the lookout, be always on the, the, the kind of a creative learning process. And, and as Sarah said earlier, this, this whole uh, kind of a process has, has no end. There is no end to, to, to creating art and there is no end to, to learn art. And, uh, and yeah, this is really important. And, and finally, my last advice, uh, I think the most important is try to always work with others, even before you're in the industry, because Making a game or creating any piece of art of that scale isn't a, a one a one man uh, process. In fact, all the vegetation I made, for example, is only possible because a lot of team members, a lot of feedback, a lot of uh, development. It's not only my work. The whole process and the whole teamwork process that is important because you will spend most time with your colleagues much more than your own family. You need to make sure that you can work with them. You can be trustworthy. You can trust your colleagues. One one student uh, asked me, I think uh, one month ago or so, he wanted to make like a, an abandoned uh, hangar in the, in the middle of a forest. He was really really um, concerned because uh, he didn't know how to make uh, trees and uh, vegetation uh, for uh, for his uh, his scene. And uh, I just asked him, do you want to specialize yourself in, in props modeling or in vegetation or level art or that kind of stuff? And he really wanted to, to, to craft the, the whole building and the, the architecture kits. So I just told, told him to find something on the internet or in your friends uh, who want to, to be a vegetation artist, for example, and uh, work with him or, or her and just create a scene together, work on your, uh, on your force, on your, no, sorry, it's in French, your strength. <laughs> sorry, it's still Monday, it's still Monday, so it's really hard to, <laughs> to warm up. Uh, yeah, wo work on your, <laughs> work on your strength and, and work on your teamwork because it, it's much more important than your, your talent, your skills. Being a good team member and being 
trustworthy in a team environment is really much more important than the art skill when you begin because if you're uh, hired for uh, with your port portfolio it's because the industry or the studio knows that you will be uh, really great at what you will do because you will do it every day for the whole production so so obviously if you're an artist you will be good at your expertise but if you're not a good team member th there is nothing that uh, social skills cannot be uh, cannot be really improved when you're in the industry you really have to work before to to to, to be sure that when you're in the team you're a team member a, you, you're not just a, an artist doing art uh, for uh, his or her sake it's really really important to to, to have that kind of a team feeling because it's it's the most important uh, according to me to, to have that uh, that team um, i don't know the the english word but appartenance that kind of um, togetherness i don't know yeah <laughs> sorry to the feeling and uh, such a um a huge industry thing here there's no room for ego because like there's all these f friendly people and we're meeting these others I, mean, I would say that this connection of meeting you through art station and being able to talk and stuff like that there's a general vibe in the environment where we are all kind of in it together and trying to share information and do it better and no one person is like yes i know how to do everything because there's so many different programs out there to learn but this opportunity to like, you know, yeah. um... to share, <laughs> to share your knowledge with the, the, the younger artists, because they will be better than us now, because uh, tools are evolving, because they are learning with the tools we are in now. And if we were learning with these tools, our work would be better. But and this is their situation. I will uh, I will give uh, classes uh, as a teacher in September in the university that I studied. It's, it's really interesting. And uh, all of the, the, the students' portfolio for the, the sessions uh, I will teach uh, are all amazing. Like, I'm really impressed and I'm really like, maybe I don't have the guts to teach them because they will teach me. When you teach or when you share your knowledge, you, you learn how to, to decrypt your pipeline, your workflow, your habits, and you learn from the people who ask you. You, you learn a lot from them and it's really... Uh, that kind of exterior point of view is a, is a good way to be a better artist, but also a good way to be a better human being. And it's really important as well, the, the soft skills in a team. And as you said, Sarah, the, the, the industry is large, but not that large. Everyone knows, mostly everyone. A lot of the students or the, the new graduated or, or, or new artists will be our colleagues in the future. So, so yeah, it, it's important to, to be nice to other to, to ask for feedback, to, to always like reach out to, to artists, to professionals, to other students, to communities, because you, you, you receive feedback, you receive tips, and it's easy to get really stressed and uh, overwhelmed. I remember myself when, uh, when I, I ended the university, uh, looking at ArtStation like all day and seeing like amazing stuff that <laughs> was really far enough from the quality of pieces uh, I, I was currently doing. So. So yeah, it's easy to be really stressed when you're alone, only showing your finished product. So it's really important to, to reach out uh, as soon as possible to professionals, to, to other team members. Uh. Learning the specific skill sometimes isn't as important as learning why that skill is important. You learn a tool not to become the ultimate master of that tool, to, but to understand why it's important. And that understanding of where exactly. it fits in the pipeline and why it's important is almost more important than just having the complete mastery of it. And it just, it does require setting aside your ego a little bit and being like, I made something horrible, but you know what? Like I understand it better because then you're going to be able to work with other people more. You're going to be able to communicate what you need with them. You're just going to have a much better understanding of how everything works and how to communicate with everyone. And it's just, it's so important to just be able to read yeah, the yeah. subtext. Because all the, the thought process behind the, an art piece you, you, you make is really more important than the tool. When you make something, do you think you make it to use only the tool or because you're an artist and you want to create something? And this is really more important. It's really like the, the centerpiece of, of your mindset, of what drives you. It's why do you use that kind of software? For example, Speedtree is really like essential in our pipeline, but 
we needed to explore different options to, to make sure that speed tree is the one we need. We, we found other things that were cool, but not the, the, the tool power we needed for our art. So it, it's really, really important to focus on what drives you and not to think only, uh, all right, I see a lot of uh, substance uh, material artists on art stations, so I should learn substance and do a uh, tileable texture. It, it's cool. It's really cool. And I love substance as well. But you should not learn something because you see other people using it. You need like to to try things, to, to learn things, and to be really uh, curious and, and courageous to, to brave, sorry, try new things, try new softwares, learn why you prefer some softwares, why, why softwares, uh, some softwares are, are most used in the industry. When you, you come in the industry, you, you will not obviously work uh, on the softwares you want because uh, there are a lot of custom softwares, there are a lot of in-house software. So, so if you're, you're really a kick-ass expert in substance, but the studio you work has no substance and will not have any li license, you have to know how to do textures, not how to do textures only in substance. If you're a, a texture artist, for example, you need to know the, the pipeline and be uh, like fluent in every tool and every software. When, when you have your pipeline and your thought process, you can easily learn, I think, any software because you know the end results you want. You don't know the path exactly, but you know what you want to do. Personally, this is really what drives me because I always keep in mind like every shape matter, for example, but at the end of the, the, the result, in fact, the final result. In uh, Assassin's Creed team, everyone work with the tool they want. So we have a lot of different pipelines and what is really important is the big picture, is the final result and is when all the departments come together. The path leading you there is really not that important for us because use the software you're most at ease with, faster with. It's really up to, to you and what is important to the team and to the game is the final product. So you have to keep that in mind and you have to, to choose the tools for the right reasons, not because you saw that uh, this tool is the new thing or this tool is only used by uh, some kind of studios. It's really important to keep in mind that we need tools to make art. We don't only make art to use tools. Some tools definitely trend. I mean, yeah. like that's the cool it truth, is. the cool thing to be using yeah. right now. We should jump to that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just uh, jumping in a tool for the sake of following the trend is not that great because you won't learn much as an artist. Yeah, you, you will be maybe an expert at the tool. You will trend because your artwork would be uh, in the mood, uh, in the actual mood. But I think what is important in a team is all your art process, all your creativity, all what you think, in fact, behind the tools, uh, who you are, what kind of artist are you? And this is really, uh, really important. And it's also very cool and important that softwares are trending. All the, the node systems were, uh, were really trendy, uh, I think, uh, five, six years ago. And it's really nice because now there is a visual scripting in a lot of softwares. It step up like the game for, uh, for user experience, user interface. So it's cool that some tools are trending. It's not cool that younger students, for example, or artists are just too afraid to explore different tools. What they saw only are the new tools or the training tools. And it's easy to get really stressed. In fact, I was really stressed when I started uh, in the industry because I used tools that were not trendy. I think uh, Joël Pelton, Raphael Lacoste and uh, Sébastien Primo uh, who were there for my interview were just like, all right, what kind of artist are you? We don't care about the tools. We don't care about Unreal Engine. We don't care about substance, about anything. What kind of art uh, do you want to make? What kind of uh, artistic vision you like? And what's behind, in fact, all the, the, the tools and pipeline and workflow? Because you will learn our workflow, our tools, but we need to make sure that you have all the, the art ingredients behind it. Yeah. I think there's a way about thinking about art that is similar to thinking about tools and that art is really taking two existing ideas and then creating another idea with it, right? And in yeah. the same way, using tools is really, it's not about learning the tool itself, but it's learning kind of the, the grammar of that tool. It's sort of like learning like new slang in a way, like how are people using this tool to communicate the same thing that I know how to communicate? You sort of have to treat them as, as building blocks to your, to your idea and your artistic concept, not as like the end itself. 
And it's really important to keep and maintain that diversity because this is what makes the industry shine. All the weird path people take to make great art, everyone use different kind of way to, to convey their mood, to do art piece. And I really fear that if, if everything is uh, too uniform, it will just be bland and, and boring. And a few years ago, uh, someone uh, making only um, houses, houses uh, faces, I don't know the, the English word as well, but um, uh, in substance. And it was really nice because I never thought about substance uh, with that kind of uh, art process. And it was really nice and I really enjoy seeing uh, people trying softwares to do things that weren't the, the obvious way of doing it. It's really, uh, it's really what keep, keeps the industry fresh, I think. And, and cool and interesting because you look at one of your mates and you see how he, how he or she is using a kind of software or another and it's really, uh, it's really great because you learn a lot uh, from this different point of view and different uh, uh, work uh, meter. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the great things about the industry too is that innovations always come from people breaking the software, right? Like doing things yeah, yeah. that they're not supposed to do with it. And even as like large studios kind of consolidate their tool sets, um, people are always going to be drawn to those new ideas and those interesting expressions of things. So there's, I, I think that we're always going to see as soon as everything kind of starts to look the same, there's going to be an uprising of something else that's going to take over and, um, you know, kind of bring something fresh. There's always going to be that cycle of something new. in. so, and it's one of the fun things about working in video game industry is, you know, you have, yeah. You know, whenever it seems like it's getting stale, there's always something new that breaks in and just, you know, really shakes things up. And it's it's always exciting. Yeah, and what I, I think uh, is really interesting uh, for me as well is that every kind of game and kind of genre use tools in a different way. For open worlds or for narrative uh, linear games, we both use Speed Tree, but we do not use Speed Tree in the same way. Because when you have to think about a recipe, about the large scale environments, you have to, to embrace like the, yeah, the recipe, the randomness, the, the, the editing for some trees. But when you work on a more uh, linear games, you, you can, uh, for example, uh, the work of uh, Alexis Boyer on, um, on the Demon's Souls uh, remake was fantastic. All the vegetation was mind blowing because every vegetation is like an art piece. Every vegetation asset is really like it's it's crazy. Uh, I'm really impressed by uh, by the work and uh, all the work in Shadow of the Colossus as well too. It's really it's really cool to see that we use the same base basis. I don't know English word as well, but uh, we use the same structure, but we create things differently uh, according to our needs of the the platform of the the game genre. I think it's it's good to be curious and to to learn how others do their stuff because uh, everyone is in a mood of sharing of uh, teaching and it's really a uh, it will just like be nice for the industry in general because all the younger artists who will come in the industry will always uh, will already be in that kind of a, a sharing mindset and uh, and it's, it's it's a kind of a kindness feeling in the industry and it's really, uh, really important to, to keep that, uh, to keep that vibe. It kind of circled full, full circle back to Bob Ross. There's like a, you know, a vibe for all creating happy little trees. I guess is your point. <laughs> the best way to do it. There's like People a just like kindness. Not when I try to, <laughs> to explain my work to some friends or some family, it always ends like, all right, uh, I'm making trees and I, I make little plants and flowers and. And a lot of people are, but you're, you're paid for that? Or you're just like doing that in your free time? <laughs> it, it's, not, it's not easy to, to explain that kind of a specialization because it's really niche, but uh, it, it's really, really interesting, I think. <laughs> this is not like the, the big cast props or character that will stand out in the game, but it's the backdrop of all the environment. So it's as important as something that shines because you have an impact on all the environments and the moods and the quality of the big picture of the game. So this is what I really like, uh, that specialty. And this, this is why it's important as well to keep in mind. It has so much impact in the big picture of the world. The best way I've heard it said is that trees are like the eyebrows of the world, right? <laughs> like, yeah. 
w yeah. w when they're missing, you notice it and it looks very strange. Yeah. But it's not necessarily like, you think like the eyes and the nose and the mouth are the most important, but the eyebrows, they're not there. It just looks weird, so it's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, for example, I, tre I treated the, the landmark trees uh, in our game the same way as characters. And I think it, it's interesting to bring other thought process of different uh, uh, discipline and departments uh, into your pipeline and your art because you will just make things that, that is better uh, when it comes together with all uh, the other departments. Because you, when you make a game, you, you tell a story. Every asset needs to convey that storytelling, need to support the gameplay experience, need to support the, the player's journey or explor exploration. And it's one of the important medium uh, in an open world, for example. Unless uh, you, you're in a planet, uh, yeah, where there is no vegetation. But... <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Everything has to be pointed in the same direction in order to communicate things. If there's like, if everything is pointing in the same direction and then your trees are pointing to a whole different mood or your character looks completely out of place, it just breaks that, that overall story and mood and, yeah. uh, you know, vision that you're trying to communicate. Yeah, because trees are used as well to frame some roads, to frame some... Uh some cities. It's really important for the mood, but as well for the composition, to hide things, to, to, to level design as well, to use some logs uh, pointing in direction, to guide the players. It's really, it's really a, a tool as well. Vegetation is not just for uh, to be there because there is trees in England, but it's important because it is a tool for the storytelling, for the mood, but as well for the design. In fact, it's not, uh, it's not only for the vegetation. And when we create art for games, it's important to keep that in mind that every asset we make needs to, to serve multiple roles uh, within the game. Especially that idea of um, blocking and covering is such an important thing too, because in large open worlds, like the trees have two purposes, like they can stand on their own and provide that upfront detail and mood, but you also need it for optimization purposes to be able to block things out and like, create a density or an illusion of density even. So like there are times where your leaves may be scaled higher than real life because you need to create that idea of density. And that's just, yeah, that's yeah. part of what you're trying to communicate. In um, fact, uh, on, on this tree, for example, each leaf, each leaf, sorry, is almost the size of the head of the main character. So yeah, this, this is crazy. And, and when, when you're too close to it in fly uh, developer mode, for example, it makes no sense. But when you look at it from a distance, it's more credible because we made uh, really smaller leaves before, but it just didn't work well in the world. So exaggerate thing, it's, uh, things, it's, it's, it's really important when you look at the, the big picture, as you said, then. It's like... It's like when you shrink those textures down, you don't have any opportunity for the, like the light to bounce off of them. And they just become little tiny speckly things and you don't really want yeah, to fill your game rainy, with yeah. noise. Yeah, you want yeah. the artistic effect yeah. to show. You want the pretty over the yeah. top light. <laughs> the exactly. You, you want the grass to be thick enough to have that kind of, uh, of waves in the wind, uh, that kind of uh, the interactions between uh, vegetation and the world, the weather, uh, the player. All that uh, is important when you create the asset. You do not create that only for the sake of this asset and one use uh, on a precise location. You need to ensure that you cover all needs, that you cover all connection with other systems. And it's really, for example, uh, even the, the bushes, you, you need to be able to hide in the bushes. So you need to have some, uh, some metrics, you need to have some cover, you need to have some shape that is that, that is really giving the feeling that the player is hidden, but not too much because otherwise it will occlude the camera and it will not be uh, easy to look at enemies or that kind of stuff. So everything uh, needs to be balanced, keeping in mind all the other departments and interaction between the systems when you make a game. Some of your smaller plants and grasses are the things that actually blow my mind the most. I think you're so, so talented at putting those things together and actually making them part of the magic like you know like you just you tend to focus on the big trees and like the big things in the scene but the big picture there and all of the little things that you've put together are there's not the flashy yeah. thing yeah. to be like look at my grass but uh it's done you, you know what the 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 all the grass assets in Valhalla were the thing that I love doing the most. I spend a lot of time doing the most, doing the grass, doing different kind of grass for Norway, for the marshes, for, for the, the rolling hills. 
And, and this is really what I preferred because it was really interesting to, to learn the shape of the grass, to, to learn like a, the interaction, interaction between the species and the grass. It was really, really interesting. And I really took inspiration for the awesome work in uh, Shadow of the Colossus, for example, because the, the grass in the, the remake of the game is just mind blowing. Grass is something that is most of the time uh, undertaking. I don't know if it's the right word, but do not think as it's a priority, but it really is because uh, there is grass everywhere on the roofs, uh, alongside the roads, uh, on the field. It, it's really, it needs to be very nice quality because it's the backdrop for the backdrop. So it's really, it's really important to, to, to keep in mind that, uh, yeah, cast trees are, are ferns because uh, you can uh, you can really uh, play in speed tree and it's really cool because uh, it's massive and it shines but every little details it, it what makes like the world credible and 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 together because we really tried to make sure that the species uh, grow together and make sense that uh, we have enough uh, grass variety for example to be sure that the grass is not too repeated uh, in different biomes so, so we need to have different moods for example, on the, the very barren and arid landscape of uh, Shropshire, uh, we need to make sure that we had uh, orange grass, uh, red grass, very dry grass. And, and it's really, um, it was really a, a, a great challenge to work on the grass. And I really loved working on the grass, even more than on the trees, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like especially as we've kind of moved into this next generation of gaming, when we're allowed to have more grass, right? it becomes just as important as the trees. Like in, in games five or six years ago, you have to yeah. create a lush idea of grass with like five blades of grass. So a lot of ground texture work and then some blades to kind of give the impression of height. And now you ha you can have these huge fields that you couldn't have previously. Like yeah. I think it was five or six years ago, the first dying light. And uh, I, I really wasn't expected any vegetation in it. And when I started playing it, I was blown away by the, the quality and the density of the grass, of the vegetation. It was so well integrated uh, with the rest. It was really, really mind blowing uh, to see, in fact, that kind of, uh, all right, we can do this. We can, we can push this. It was really, uh, it was really, really uh, interesting. I'm with you though. I think that grass is such an interesting, challenging problem. And when it's <laughs> done well, it just like blows your mind because it's just, it's yeah. so detailed and and honestly, it's just so soft. Like I just love the f when it when you get grass right in a game, and it's just like fluffy and like yeah. it just it's satisfying. <laughs> yeah, and also when you when you start working on the 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 vertex painting for the interaction with the player, the bending of the grass, the wind, it, it's so nice because it's small assets, but on a large scale, it moves so well with the with the players, with the NPC, with the weather. It's really, really uh, satisfying to, to work on grass and to see like the big scattering of it. Uh, in fact, we we had a test world uh, to 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 push. In fact, the scattering to the most to see uh, to see uh, where we can uh, we can go for the game. And we had uh, this kind of a uh, 64 by 64 kilometers uh, landscape with only the same asset of grass but with a very very big density and it was so satisfying just to move on this open barren landscape with a lot of grass moving in the wind it was really a uh, really satisfying <laughs> and if I, if I if i told my colleagues that we are talking about grass uh, for 10 minutes they will all uh, laugh i think <laughs> it's that like large scale texture that you don't get when you're running by it as a, like a player like you yeah. see all the grass at once but you can't appreciate the texture on every single tree branch as you you know run yeah. by it every part of the vegetation need to be the same quality because it con it conveys everything together so so yeah it's really important to, to find the balance between having some assets like the big trees which shine uh, when when uh, we place it but also to keep in mind that the vegetation is not here to take over the spotlight. It's only here to, to guide the player, to guide the, the environments. Uh, for example, uh, we used it on uh, architecture as well to blend like different uh, different uh, architecture style together, the Roman ruins with the Saxon uh, architecture. Our art director, Rafael, said uh, we wanted, uh, it's, it's hard to say, but I will say it, uh, harsh uh, romanticism, post-apocalyptic uh, Roman uh, architecture. So, uh, so yeah, it's uh, we really wanted to have that kind of a uh, romantic uh, uh, approach for the vegetation. That it, it's not the shiny thing uh, on the game, 
but it, it allow uh, everything to come together to 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 bring uh, the idea of seasons of progression of uh, colors of density uh, as well as gameplay opportunities uh, as we spoke earlier like uh, parkour uh, hiding uh, covering it's really a, it's really an important medium and we really need to think on all the details of it like the grass the, the tiniest details to the, the macro level uh, uh, details as well that's such a great descriptor of the it's a lot of adjectives at once but that's that really does hit the mood that you have to go for in that that you guys really do capture kind of like post-apocalyptic but post-apocalyptic if you lived in medieval times you know yeah. it's a yeah it's a really great descriptor of that world <laughs> It was really, really, really wild because uh, before uh, working on Valhalla, I even didn't know about all that, about all that, the different layers of history, about uh, uh, complete Roman cities in England. It was so interesting uh, to, to, to go through all that historical research because we learned a lot uh, about the, the flora of the, the, this, uh, the, this century, but as well as the, the, the history, the architecture, the, the life there. So yeah, it, it was really interesting to, to dive into this research. Well, we could we could probably talk about trees all day because that's, that's yeah. <laughs> what we do all day, but we've yeah. probably got to, uh, you know, kind of start to wrap things up. But before we do, one big thing is you've got a talk coming up at GDC. Yeah, so, so our talk with Vladimir is the natural world of Assassin's Creed Valhalla. So it's a very big breakdown of all the creation and the thought process of the biomes of Valhalla. So as well as the big picture, so, so our research or our direction, vision and that kind of stuff, but also all the, the tiniest details like the scattering, the, the sculpting, and not on a, on a tool by tool mindset, but more on a, this is our thought process and this is how we use tools and we, we make that happen. And all the challenges and mistakes that uh, that come with, so uh, so I I hope it will be interesting. It was really strange to, because it's more natural when you're on a stage and we, you're talking with people, and we were like here uh, in my apartment talking to a camera with the the GDC crew, and it was really uh, when we were uh, just like uh, repeating the our talk, it was really fluent and and cool, and we were able to bring some jokes between the slides. And when we had to record the GDC and it just kicked that, all right, this is the GDC. This is not like just a kind of repetition on Microsoft Teams. It was really, uh, really stressful. It was a very hot day as well. So, so we were like at the end sweating and, uh, and very stressed. But I think, I hope uh, this will be interesting and it will uh, talk about all the, the breakdown of our, the creation of the natural world of Assassin's Creed Valhalla. I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing it. I mean, you know, again, I could talk all day about what you guys are doing and, you know, I can't wait to just see even more like in-depth breakdowns and stuff. I know it's going to be really exciting. We'll make sure that we've got a link down uh, in the description to where it's going to be and some more details there about where people can find it and where people can find more of your work on your art station and find out more about Assassin's Creed. So. And uh, spoiler alert, uh, I'm struggling uh, with the grammar, English and uh, pronunciation as well on the GDC talk. <laughs> <laughs> If someone, someone watching uh, had the, the bravery to, to, to get through uh, all this talk, maybe the, the GDC talk would be a walk in the park. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for having this talk with us. Thanks for sitting down and talking trees. And uh, we look forward to seeing more of what you do and, uh, you know, maybe having you on for future broadcasts. Yeah, thank you. It was really interesting. And in fact, uh, when we started talking together uh, since, uh, I think, uh, end of last year, I really like love knowing you, learning from you, talking with you. It's really, uh, I think it's really cool to, to have that kind of brainstorm, chill vibe together. I'm really happy if someone else can enjoy what we are saying about trees, about the industry. And it's really important and it's, it's our duty as artists and as software or game developers to share that knowledge and to, to teach to the younger generations of artists because they will take over at a certain time. Keeping secrets will not make the industry better. Sharing our knowledge, just create ideas to, to use tools in a different way and, and, and ban some software. And it's really, it's really that and that kind of uh, sharing that is really uh, helping the industry. Exactly.
Yeah. It's been absolutely crucial to us just that you've been so willing to have all these long conversations just in the direction we take speed tree and w what each pipeline is doing, you know, it's always different. So um, we've appreciated your time. And Sorry, there is a, a big siren in my street. I was, uh, I warn you, so sorry, Sarah, <laughs> I interrupted you. We didn't have a single dog bark. Yeah, my dog has been asleep this entire time, uh, miraculously. He's been very uh, kind of antsy today, so I'm really glad. Yeah, I locked my cat outside as well, because uh, otherwise she'd just jump uh, in front of the camera and play with the microphone, so... Yeah. That's the thing people want to see. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That'll be a separate live stream where it's just pets the entire time. Just pets and trees. <laughs> Ten hours.